holy, 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 holy God, God, who reigns far above the heavens, may you grant us to be strengthened with all power and endurance as we trust in you for the working out of our salvation, for the genuineness of our love to continue, and for the message of true eternal life to be witnessed through our lives. Lord, we ask you in the only way we know how, through the blood of Jesus Christ, that you may touch our hearts today in a new way. Teach us, Lord. Teach us to follow you for the sake of your glory. In Jesus' name. of new faces out there. Terrific to have you all here. It's great. I, there's a rumor that there are some uh, relatives of Tyler's here, but I don't know. It just could be a rumor. Uh, okay, so you guys have uh, seen most of these announcements probably already, but I wasn't here last week, so some of these are new to me. Uh, a meeting at Freddy's Freeze. Who is doing that? That's cool. Yeah, Karen? Tyler. Or Tyler. You're doing a meeting at Freddy's Freeze. Want to tell us about it? Yeah. So anyone's welcome to come and join at 5.30 on Friday. Yeah, we're really just going to eat some pizza, enjoy each other's company, and hand out some flyers to the rest of the community. And yeah, at the end of it, I'm just going to share what I believe about Jesus for about five minutes. Anyone's welcome to come, and I would highly encourage it. So. Okay, cool. Um, and then you see the next announcement. Tyler, you should just stay up here. <laughs> we, went, we, we went in the back beforehand when we were divvying up responsibilities. I didn't know he'd take over here. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. And then anyone who would like to discuss any evangelism tactics throughout uh, the next two weeks or just learn ways that we could share the gospel effectively... Just encourage anyone who wants to have a little fellowship over that, get into some scripture, maybe look over some um, well-known evangelists who are still alive today or in church history and ways that they use and things that they would do to reach people for the sake of the gospel. Just encourage you to contact me and I'm more than open and, and uh, you know, it's what I love. It's, it's who I love and it's who we love. So, yeah, just Good. contact me if you uh, desire that. I, uh, I encourage you guys to do that. There's uh, certainly a, a need out there to, uh, to reach these people. Uh, there's such joy that awaits them uh, on the other side. Okay, so small groups, adult Sunday school. Uh, Terry, did you have that this morning? Where's Terry? Oh, so that's, that's, uh, that's in effect and, and going strong. Uh, thank you, Terry, for, for leading that. Uh, men's Bible study. Are you leading that too, Tyler? Tuesday nights. Tuesday nights. Thank you for that. Uh, that would be, uh, that's here, like in the church basement, and online, it says. So, uh, yeah. would, should they contact you for, for that? Please. Yeah, anyone, uh, anyone, so this is not just men's at 645. Anyone's welcome to join. But there are two different ones. This is the same one that happens every week at 645 on Tuesday. And we're going to meet downstairs at 830 a.m. It's men's only. So we're going through 1 Corinthians. Okay. So the men in the, Got it. In the church. Got it. Heard that. Same, same day of the week. Okay. Um, and.
and uh, Tyler will cover the prayer. I want to make one other announcement. So keep an eye on the back of the bulletin for what is coming up and for assignments and stuff like that. Diane, did you have an announcement? That... Um, I have two announcements. Next week, um, both are um, Courtney and your sister Asa downstairs are going away in the family holiday. So we need two people to fill in for the nursery and for preschool for just that one Sunday. And so please see me afterwards. And today we have our first Friday night yeah, yeah, we'll um, yeah. meeting after church outside under the tree. So we even the heat. <laughs> uh, trustees are also meeting today and will be over here in the new edition. It should be a pretty short meeting. If there's anything you want to bring to the trustees, you got about five minutes after meeting and Deb will be over there. Good. Hi. Hi. Um, you all know car sales coming up. It's still quite a ways away, but I wanted to um, let everybody know that are all welcome to come and help. Um, I'll give you the dates right now and I will post them on the I, I, it's probably just me, but those, all those dates, are those dates of preparation then? And there's yes. one day of the price sale? Yes. yes. Okay. We do, we do three days ahead of pie crust. Okay. Because that's an all day thing and it's exhausting. Yeah. So that's why we separate it with the, you know, with the week. Um, and then Thursday we prepare the boxes. We make um, two kinds of pie, put them together. And then on Friday, we make the remaining two kinds of pie and sell. Got it. And that's it. I'm asking that you put your phone number down or whoever signs up, put your phone number down because we do have early pre-orders and then you've forgotten. Yep. So um, it's very helpful if we know that we can get a hold of you. Well, um, I am not a very good pie maker, but I bet you can peel apple. <laughs> Take it out of the <laughs> I better shut up. You're right. I can peel an apple. If anyone has a clamp-on apple peeler, we would certainly love to be able to borrow that. Um, the kind that sticks don't stick well to our table, yeah. so they slide. Any other announcements? Yes, Ruth. Our prayers last Sunday were answered. Carly Wolf was born. Oh, terrific. What a nice name. That's great. Congratulations. Anybody else? Okay. Well, let's uh, keep going then. Uh, our responsive reading is on... Uh, psalm that's on page uh, 954 and I will read the even or sorry the odd numbered verses and you respond with even in your few Bibles page 954 Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, 
but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet, but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. O house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. And the Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord make you increase, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. It is he who has told the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Our next hymn is number 316, Macedonia. I'm not sure that we've sung this uh, before, but we'll, uh, easy, right? Easy peasy, okay. Number 316, please uh, join us.
Christmas for a children's what? message? Okay. Cool. Oh, you look nice today. Is that a new dress? Yeah, that's sharp. Hi, guys. It's a water gun camera. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have any water gun. Okay. 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 So, I've got some stuff over here. Yeah, have you guys ever heard of the word packaging? I've heard it. You've heard the word before. Let me show you what packaging looks like. Okay. Nope. Oh, sorry. So, what are these? Packaging, yeah. What? You're moving ahead. Those are nuts. These are almonds, right? You guys allergic to almonds? I don't like them. I'm not allergic to anything. I don't like them. Okay, I won't open it then. I like them. You like almonds? Well, maybe later you and I can have some. She likes the allergic to them. Oh, okay. Well, what's in. I've got a question for you. What's. Yeah, it's a package. Why did Mrs. Smith buy these? Was it for the packaging on the outside or what's on the inside? Yes. Nuts. Nuts, right? She wanted the, what was on the inside. Yeah. The packaging is just kind of holds it there, right? Yeah. The packaging is just something to so it doesn't spill out all over your hands and, and stuff like that. Oh, you have to wash your hands. Yeah, you have to wash your yeah. hands, and it's you can't really put a bunch of nuts in the cupboard because it'd get all dirty and your mom would get mad. Okay. There might be lots of germs on it. Here's another example. No, I'll later. Here's another example. What's this? A package. Yes, exactly. It's a package. This is a game. It's called Scrabble. Scrabble Jr. I never heard of it. Well, they say it's fun. <laughs> I've never played this game because it's still got the shrink wrap on it, right? But what's more important, the package or what's on the inside, the game? The package. No. <laughs> it's what's on the inside is what's important. The game. What? You don't buy it for the box. You buy it for what's inside, right? Wow. Okay. Two more examples. Um, what's this? I it's a mattress pad, actually. But did Mrs. Smith buy this for this plastic stuff? No. No, she bought it for the mattress pad. She's gonna throw away the the packaging, you know she the packaging is gonna get thrown away. It kinda looks like a blanket. Do you guys know where I'm going with this children's message? Okay. What's this? Um message. It's a letter. You guys probably don't know what US mail is, but it's this comes in your post box. This, I suspect, is some stuff that I asked for. This is what's important, is what's inside the letter. This, I'm gonna throw away. Yeah, you're gonna throw it away. The packaging, forget that. It's what this I want. Did you leave it for a long time? It might have germs on it. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Okay, now here's the big thing. The big thing is that this, you know, this body, this body, some people think that the body is the most important thing about us. But you know what's really important? Is what's inside your body and all the great big thinkers throughout the ages, they came up with a name for it. What's in kind of inside your body, inside the stuff we can touch and feel. Do you know what that word is? It starts with a s. Skin. No, good guess though. Soul. soul. It's your soul. So we, this body, we're just kind of like packaging for our souls. And our souls are what's really important. And your soul, you might know that your soul, when you feel a little bit of, oh, that's the right thing to do, I should do that or, oh, that's the wrong thing to do, I shouldn't do that. That sort of way that, you know how when you think sometimes, oh, that's not good, I better not do that. 
that's kind of your soul telling you what to do and what not to do. And your soul grows over time, but your soul doesn't belong to this body. That's just packaging. Your soul belongs to God. And Jesus is the person that says, okay, you're my, you're my, you're, you're, you're my soul. And so that's that's the important thing to remember. God's my friend because I'm He's my friend too. He's all yeah. our fathers. He what? He's our father. <coughs> exactly. Good. Well, you guys didn't even need a children's list. Should we stand up and pray? Any questions? No. Okay, let's pray. Okay, you guys hold hands. Okay, ready? God, we thank you for these children. We thank you so much for the blessings that you showered on them. Uh, strengthen their faith. Let them protect their souls and guide them to Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Do they go downstairs? No, yes. Okay. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for the souls that you've given us, Lord. God, we ask that you would guide our souls today, God, that you would speak to our souls, Lord, that you would teach us what it means to have a soul. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Does anyone have any prayer requests this morning? So I'm going to give you each one of mine. Lord, you're good. You've always been good. You've always been faithful. Lord, that you would consider us. That you would look down on us from the heavens. And have mercy on us, Lord. You never had to, but you chose to. Lord God, we come to you by the blood of Jesus, lifting up Olivia. Father God, we ask you to bless her appointment this Friday, God. That you give the doctors heavenly wisdom. That you give them discernment, grace, and clarity, Father God that ultimately you would draw Olivia closer to you through this process, God, and that you would comfort her even, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord God, and we thank you that Nicholas is coming home, God. We praise you, Lord. We thank you that you've been with him, God. We thank you for the way that you've, you've uh, gathered this church around him, Father God, to, to be there, Lord. And God, I ask that you would guide Nicholas's soul closer to you for your glory, God. We ask that you would draw him near to you, God. As he returns, God, may he seek your face, Father, and trust in you. In the name of Jesus, we worship you. Amen. Amen. That's good. Yeah, so if we can have the ushers come forward to collect the tithe.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. appreciate the psalm that we sang. Not to us, but to him be the glory. There's something really powerful when someone else gets the glory, they carry the burden for the glory that they get. So not only is God getting the glory, but he also carries the burdens of his people. Our job, our job is to receive from him. Our job is to live lives that are worthy of him, that are full of joy, that are full of love. Not to reject love, which is found in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read 1 John 2 to begin. So if anyone wants to join me. I do have 29 verses here, fair warning. So we're going to get through this by uh, about a half an hour in the last week. A little longer, and I thank you guys for that. Just a Father God, we're asking that you would speak to us, Lord. We're asking that you would move us, Lord. We're asking that as we read this, that you would incline our hearts to your testimonies, that you would open our hearts to your understanding, that you would unite our hearts to fear you more than we fear anything else, and that you would satisfy us with your love and your mercy and change us, God, change us, because we don't want to leave the way that we came because we're confessing that we're not perfect and we want to be changed, to be made more like you into love. Please speak to us now, Lord. My dear children, before I even read this, before I get into this, I just want to preface that this entire book, entire letter, John says, my little children, my little children, my little children. Because in the face of God, there's not a human being on earth today that isn't. When you are his, his little child still and will be. So John is writing this letter. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing to you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he was going because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, 
because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who was from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the anti-Christ. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointed teaches you about all things... And as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. Father, we're asking you to do something that we can't do by human effort. Lord, Lord, you've seen me, God. You knew me when I could throw a football before I was a Christian. You knew me when I could ride a bicycle before I was a Christian. You knew me when I could create music before I was a Christian, Lord. You knew me when I could speak well before I was a Christian. But today, God, we're asking you to do something that no human can do unless it's by the Spirit of God. Father God, I'm praying for hearts to be enlightened today, God. I'm praying for minds to be illuminated, God. I'm praying for people to be drawn into the truth, God. I'm praying that you would bind the powers of darkness, Father God, and that you would show us who is the true light, and that you would speak to us who is the true love, Father God. We ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting in verse 1, I'm going to go through verses 1 through 6. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Remember, we're coming from last week where we said that if we step into the light, if we just would confess our sins, if we would just come to Jesus, then he would be faithful and just to forgive us. Now, we're also talking about a letter, 1 John. Remember, we're talking about there are different heretics that are within that have crept around. And we see later in the chapter, it says they went out from us. So they had spread these lies, and now John is exhorting them about what is the truth and who is God. He says, I'm writing to you that you don't sin. So anyone who would say, you become a Christian, you can just sin and get away with it? Oh, so you're saying because you went to Jesus that yeah, you can just do whatever you want now? You can commit these wrongs? This is the word that we believe, the word that tells us, I'm writing these things so that you do not sin. We don't believe that. It says, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, the world word atoning sacrifice, in a lot of translations, there's another word. It's called propitiation, and that's what I want to talk about today. For a second, what is propitiation? Propitiation means that the 
the full righteousness that is in God, that the righteous penalty for sin, the righteous wrath has been satisfied through Jesus Christ. Propitiation means the righteous demands of the law have been satisfied through Jesus Christ. We know that in Romans 6.23, it tells us that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I do want to say something at the end of verse 2. It says, the whole world. And John is speaking to his congregation, these churches, the different house groups that are meeting in Ephesus. He's not saying that everyone in the world has their sins forgiven here. He's saying that here I'm writing to, to you guys, but it's, it's not just for our sins. It's for anyone who would believe in Jesus because he's the atoning sacrifice, his propitiation. So I'm just going to draw a picture really quick of a room called the Great White Throne Judgment. God the Father is righteous. God the Father is compassionate. God the Father is good. He's a loving Father. You cannot have true love without true justice. Before I go to that picture, I want you to picture that you go into a courtroom and you walk in and you've done something wrong. And some of us have been in the courtroom more than others. By God's grace, he delivers us. Imagine you go into a human courtroom and you're standing in that courtroom and you have broken the law. Let's just say for something small like a speeding ticket. Does a good judge say, go? Maybe, maybe there's human mercy sometimes where he says, you could take this class to get out of it. Maybe he says you can go through a program to get it off your record. But what about it? Let's, let's heighten the standard here. Let's say someone murders your best friend and you walk into that courtroom and the judge says, Oh, I just, I just forgive you. You're good. Just go. That's not justice. That's not a good judge. That's a wicked judge. That's a judge who doesn't care about people. That's a judge who doesn't love. But that's not our Father in Heaven. Our Father in Heaven is a good, good judge. We talked about the scariest thing about God last week. The scariest thing about God. He's good. And it's scary because we're not. Because we've sinned. It's something that a lot of us wouldn't admit. I wouldn't admit most of my life. How could I? I thought I was a good person doing good things. Because we measure ourselves to one another. But if you go into that courtroom and you've committed a murder and the judge says you've done wrong, will you say, yeah, but I had friends who were there and to them I looked pretty good. You know, they, they saw my nice car. They liked it. You know, they were cheering me on. Oh, I had some girlfriends. They made me feel a certain way. They were cheering me on. They were backing me up. They were supporting me while I did this evil thing. What about my family? I, I just grew up that way. God, I don't know what to tell you. I, I grew up that way. This is the, the you put me here. It's, it's about you. It's, it's not about me. You put me here, so therefore I couldn't help. No, we've all sinned. And if you walk into that courtroom and you say you committed murder, it's not going to matter what your reason is. A good judge puts forth justice. The righteous demands of God, the good, just God, is wrath against evil. We've all committed evil. And so let's just be honest. Like, I'll be the first to raise my hand. Like, we've done it. Like, we've, we've walked away from God. We've trusted in ourselves. And as we walk into this courtroom of the great white throne judgment that Revelation speaks about, this is coming. Look, either the book is true or it's not. I didn't write it. I couldn't come up with it. Someone gave me one one day. I read it. I believe it. If it's not true, there's a lot of weird people in the room right now. <laughs> there's a lot of weird people believing a lot of weird things, living um, crazy lifestyles. If, if God's not true, if Satan's not real, angels and demons aren't real, if sin doesn't exist, if the cross doesn't exist, what are we doing here? Honestly, it's a good question. We're in the great white throne judgment, which scripture talks about. And God says that all who have sinned 
There's a penalty that needs to be paid. Are you going to pay your own penalty? Is the question I have for you today. Because as you're in this great white throne judgment, let me just expand a little bit bigger. You live in a temporal universe. You see things with your eyes. Things happen all the time where we discover things that we can't see. So let's go there. Let's go to a place that we can't see for a second. There, there are things that we cannot hear. We're humans. Science begins to tell us that dogs can sometimes hear things that we can't hear. You know, there's a dog whistle at. Okay, there are things outside of the spectrum of our own auditory senses and our own visual senses. There is a world that you can't see. And honestly, if you're not the creator of the world, as some people would say that, that we're God. Some people would say we're God. And if someone ever tells you, hey, I'm God, ask him to create another son. Ask him to, ask him to do something. If someone ever says, I'm God, and you know that's the purpose while we're here, we create our own purpose. We make our own purpose. Ask them if they've achieved their purpose yet. We make our own purpose. We just live our own life. Well, are you completely satisfied forever? If you died right now, have you done everything that you need to do for the rest of your life forever? Because God can say, yes, I have, because he's perfect, he's holy, he's just. You're in the great white throne judgment in eternity. You're not in the room we're in right now. You're not in a local courthouse. You're in the great white throne judgment of eternity. Christians will not be there. Christians will not be in that room. Because the propitiation is Jesus Christ. Because as you stand before God, those who say, I believe this man, not me, not me. I believe that guy, that God. This is a picture that someone has crafted, but we know that Jesus might not exactly look like that. But here we have a representation that can lead us into worship, that can lead us. But, but still, there is, we are not looking at this one. We're saying, to him, he, to him, he did it on the cross for me. I couldn't do it, God. I put my faith in your son. I put my faith in your beloved son that you sent to be crucified on a cross for me, to die for me. And through that faith, you are free. You're not going to the great white throne judgment. But all who don't put their faith in Jesus will end up there. Propitiation means that the righteous demands of the law were satisfied. You walk into the courtroom, and the penalty you have to pay, it's been paid in full, forever. This is a legal forensic justification. What does that mean? It means that the wrath of God was satisfied, but in the moment where Jesus was saying, hey, I'm guilty. Put the guilt on me. He wasn't actually guilty. He, he didn't all of a sudden become corrupt. He didn't all of a sudden um, become unclean. And as we're standing there, we're saying, hey, God, I receive. Because when he takes our sins and we put our faith in him, we receive his righteousness. It's a transfer. It doesn't mean all of a sudden we're perfect in that moment. No, we've received something that we didn't earn. We've received something that was not of us. It was of Jesus Christ. And because it's of Jesus Christ, one, we have no boast before God. It doesn't mean that Jesus was corrupt, and it doesn't mean that, that we're all of a sudden perfect, but it means that legally, before God, We've, our sin has been paid for. This is through faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Verse 3 says that we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Some of the heresies that were going around, Gnosticism, Gnostics, they had this kind of um, thing where they just knew something. It was like this um, esoteric knowledge, like this, this hidden knowledge where you had to come to their teachers to learn what they were telling you. And if you came to them and you achieved a certain level of knowledge, then you were saved. They said it's only a spiritual thing. It has nothing to do with the physical. They said our bodies don't matter. And these are the same ones who are claiming to be sinless. 
because they were saying that spiritually we have this enlightened understanding. And because we have this enlightened understanding, our bodies no longer matter. So they're going around doing whatever they want with their body, sinning against God, not born again, not saved, and just saying knowledge. You need to chase after knowledge. It sounds familiar. The knowledge of good and evil in Genesis. They were saying, you need knowledge to save you. Now, this is a true statement, but you don't need knowledge intellectually to save you alone. You need knowledge of a person. You need to know someone to be born again. You need to know Jesus Christ. In John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, it says, Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. An expensive perfume, Mary poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. He said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. There's perfume that Mary has that's worth a year's wages. It's uh, expensive perfume. She took it and poured it on someone's feet. Why would she take her most, why would she take a year's perfume and pour it on a, a man's feet and take her hair and wipe down his feet with her hair? Something was going on there. Either she's crazy or she's crazy in love. I believe she's crazy in love. Verse 4 says, The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Why does a Christian love? Why would Mary pour out that perfume? Is it because that, that she just saw something um, physically attractive that she was just going to take her, her highest perfume and just throw it on her life before someone? Is that why Christians obey? It's out of love. See, when you love someone, it produces something in you. Love is not cheap. It actually comes with substance. And inside of love, you actually are changed. And this is why we obey the commands of Jesus. What's going on here is he's not actually exhorting anyone to obey commands. It doesn't say. He's not, there's no, there's, he's not an exhortation. This is a test. Brothers and sisters in the faith, this is a test. And this letter was written to encourage Christians who are in the faith. You are in the faith. Those ones who left, that person who came, they whispered those things in their ear and then they were gone within a year or two. They're not a Christian. They're not. Don't listen to what they were telling you. Don't get caught up on it. People get caught up on temporal things all the time. Money. Cars. The thrills of this life. The pride of life that we're going to go over later. Relationships on earth. It says that this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. We do this out of love. There's a word named ontology. Ontology means the study of being. It's the nature of something. This is ontologically made out of wood. This is ontologically paper. It's what it is. Ontologically, we're all humans in this room. Therefore, we do human things. We reason. We create things. We pursue relationships. But we're not human because we reason. We reason because we have minds as humans. There's a difference. Ontologically, a dog has the nature of a dog. A dog barks. But he's not a dog because he barks. That's not what makes him a dog. He barks because that's what dogs do. Ontologically, an apple tree has the nature of an apple tree. Therefore, it produces apples. But it's not an apple tree because it produces apples. It produces apples because 
it is an apple tree. There's a, there's a huge difference there. Imagine just walking up to an apple tree. You pick an apple, you don't say, oh, you're an apple tree because you produce apples. No, what you could more accurately say is, I know you're an apple tree because you have produced this apple, because that's what apple trees do. That's the way that things work ontologically. Ontologically, a Christian loves. Ontologically, a Christian obeys the commands of God because that's who we've been made to be. It's impossible without Jesus. We cannot obey God's command without Jesus Christ. There are tests here, but this is not how we come to faith. So if someone reads this and they say, okay, we come to know him if we obey his commands. Okay, the man says, I don't know him. He doesn't do what he commands. He's a liar. The truth is not in him. And then that person says, okay, I gotta go do what he commands because I wanna know him. I wanna know him. No. You go to Jesus. And when you go to Jesus, your life is changed. And all of a sudden, Mary is pouring perfume at the feet of Jesus and wiping it with her hair. I've never seen someone do that. I don't think people just begin to fall in love with Jesus. I believe they meet him. And when they meet him, they begin to fall in love with who he is. And that's about how every relationship works in this life. You can fantasize about someone that you've never met. What would it look like to be in a relationship with them? But until you meet that person, you don't actually really begin to fall in love with that person. We need to meet Jesus Christ. And those of us who have met him, we need to get to know who he is. And as we get to know who he is, then we'll fall more in love. Then you'll see fruit produced in a Christian life. Verse 7 says, Dear friends, I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is a message you have heard, yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He says, I'm not writing to an old command, I'm writing to a, a, a new command. But, but what is he saying? He's saying, well, well, it's an old one and it's a new one. Leviticus verse, chapter 19, verse 18 says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. It's the same command. John chapter 13, 34, underneath the new covenant says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Old, new, sound the same, love your neighbor as yourself. Wait, hold on, it says, as I have loved you. So what's, what's different? Now we know personally, we know relationally, we actually have a relationship with the true God. It talks about a true light in verse eight. The true light is already shining. John 1, 4 to 13 says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. This life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. And I was about a man named John. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural sin, nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. It says, verse 9, since the true light gives light to everyone that's coming to the world. This is the true light that's being referred to. Verse 9 says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. I don't believe that I have a call to judge those who don't know Jesus Christ. I don't believe anyone who knows Jesus has a call to hold in condemning judgment those who don't know Jesus Christ. I do believe those who don't know Jesus Christ are living in condemnation. There's a huge difference. If you walk into a room with someone and you say, 
You are living a life that is contrary to God. You don't know God. God is the only way, truth, and life. I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to pretend like you're headed to heaven. It's not real. It's not true. If you're headed towards a brick wall, you're driving a car, and you're um, you're next to someone, and, and you're going to make a, a right, but there's a brick wall in front of you, and they're not going to make a right. They're looking at you. They're staring at you. And they're not looking at the brick wall they're about to run into because they're looking at you. You love the person. Hey, there's a brick wall in front of you, man. You're going to crash and burn and die. I'm not going to pretend like it's not there. That's hatred, man. That, you must hate someone to not tell them. That's the reality we're living. If only we knew. If we knew Jesus and what he saved us from and what heaven is and what hell is. And if we knew what the word was, we live different lives. We need to know it more and more and more. <clears throat> but do you, do you look at that person and say, you, you, you idiot, you, you idiot, you idiot, and you just say, you, man, you suck, man. You can't see. How dare you? You can't see. Man, if only you knew what we knew. If you came, if you came to, to our church building, if you, if you went the way that we went in our denomination, if you did this thing that we did, no, you say, there's a wall, turn. You say, Jesus can save you. You're not holding them in judgment. They already are headed towards the wall. They're already living a life of condemnation. He talks about being blinded. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. Now remember, love in one another is not how we come to know God. We know God and then we love one another. We must go to God First, whoever hasn't gone to God first, it says he is blinded. This is just test. It's showing, hey, there are some that are not born again. And there are some that are born again. If you are born again, this is for you. Now, in the church he was writing to, he was writing it to believers. He was encouraging them in the faith. But what happens when you encourage some in the faith, those who are not in the faith, it's clear, it's evident. It says that the darkness has blinded them. I'm going to run through some quick verses. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. Person's driving towards the wall, can't understand they're driving towards a wall, can't understand they're about to crash and burn and die. But you're about to make a right turn. You got your turn signal on. All of a sudden, scripture promises persecution for Christians. Christian, Christians are called to live a life that is worthy of being insulted. Acts chapter 5 verse 41 talks about the disciples. They were beaten and mocked and they left the place praising God saying, thank you, I am worthy to be insulted for your name. That's a concept that, that, that doesn't go very, if you see a man walking in integrity and he walks into a room full of people that are cheating, that are lying, even business wise, let's say Let's say you're in a, in a business setting and, and you've got a good, you practice integrity in your business and you walk in and everyone wants to cheat and everyone wants to use each other and you walk in there and you see 10 guys and you're one guy and you see them all cheating. Glorious thing to walk out of that room, not buy into what they're doing and have them insult you. That just shows how different you are. I don't just want to be against the things that the world stands for. I want the world to be against the things that I stand for. It ought to be that different. We ought to be so separated that there is a clear difference. You and you are absolutely by no means the same. It says that the things that come from the Spirit of God, he considers them foolishness. The ones who doesn't accept 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced you in a shameful ways. So we do not use deception in order to distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. They cannot see it. Blinded. It's 
It says they're blind. He does not know where he's going. The darkness has blinded him. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12 says, All the ways that wickedness deceives those that are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in witnesses. God sends them a powerful delusion. Is God unjust? Well, back up. It says they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Go back to the business example. You walk into that room and there's 10 guys. They never learned correct business practice. They grew up a certain way. They didn't know who Jesus was like the rest of us. We grew up as sinners. You walk into that room and all of a sudden you want to teach that guy about who Jesus is. And they reject the truth. They reject what you have to give them. They have chosen to reject the truth. The truth was given to them, and in that rejection, they're given away to their own desires. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15 through 16 says, This people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, in turn. And I would heal them. He says, I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. People's hearts have become callous. Those who walk in the darkness, their hearts are callous. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus has come to set free those who are in darkness. This is not the end. If there is a test here that says, hey, if you are doing this, you're a Christian. If you're doing this, you're just simply not a Christian. Now, is it ever my place to walk up and say, you? No, I don't think so. But is it the place of the word of God, which says it reads all men's hearts and the spirit of God discerns? The things of the heart. Who can know man's heart but the spirit of God that's in them? The spirit of God has the right. God has the right. So if we are just simply speaking forth his word, and it simply says that those who are in the darkness are blinded, the answer comes in John 8, 12, for your life. It says, Jesus spoke it to the people and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I grew up in darkness. You grew up in darkness. We all grew up in darkness. And Jesus is saying you will have the light of life. Isaiah 42, 16, this is old covenant prophecy about Jesus in the future. He says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. 2 Corinthians 3.16 says, Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So, we know that those who are loving each other, you know that you're, you surely are a Christian when you have love for those around you, when you're obeying God's commands. Verse 15, let's skip to verse 15. It says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the Father, the love of the Father is not in him. Everything in the world, craving the civil man, lust of his eyes, boasting what he has and does. Look at what I have. Look at what I've done today. Look at me, 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 me. Before God, it's nothing. It comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. I have desires in me. You have desires in you. I have opinions. You have opinions. I have feelings. You have feelings. And none of these things, we have emotions, we have longings. There's a reason why we live our life. You can just simply ask yourself the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? And when you come to the answer, you know what's leading you. Why am I doing what I'm doing right now? And your answer will help you discern what's leading you. We all have desires. Anything that's for the world is going to pass away. And it's important to emphasize here, he's not saying everything you can see or hear with your ear see with your eyes, see with your ears, is bad. He's not saying that's all evil. He says the, the love of these things, the cravings of sinful men, the sinful desires, the things that stand against God. We know in Genesis, when God makes all of creation, after he makes things, he said, I saw that it was good. I saw that it was good. Psalm 19, verse 1. It says the heavens declare the glory of God. What a beautiful thing to look up at the sun, to look at the clouds, to look at the beauty that God's made. Well, God literally says in his word, that what you're seeing, 
That's declaring my glory night and day. You have the opportunity to look up and look to God night and day. And I've put something above you. God is above us in heaven, and he's put something above us, the heavens, to declare his glory. It doesn't mean, oh, that's the glory of God when I see like a really beautiful cloud or the sunrise or something, but how beautiful is it to see something like that? And it reflects, it says, hey, that's how glorious God is, except way more. It's, it's reflecting his glory to us. There are good things. Enjoying family is a good thing. Going to work is a good thing. Living life. Going on a boat is a good thing. But when you love these things more than you love God, the love of the Father is not in him. That desire that you have is passing away. It's not going to be there. It's a, it's, you're living for something that's not, it, 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 as real as it is, it's not really worth anything. I can't, I can't make the weight of heaven fall on you, but I pray that God would open up all of us to the weight of eternity. God is forever. It's kind of like, hey, that's, that's, that's where reality is. Because it is. We live in this temporal reality. It's fading. It's, it's passing away. Whoever does God's will lives forever. Why? Because God too has desires. He's a person with desires and opinions. He's a person. Get to know God. Some of us have heard stories of these small town um, musicians who are doing really well. They're performing at... Um, local open mics and they're well known in the community maybe plugged into a nice church and then all of a sudden they get recognized for their their um, musicious talent and an agent offers them a deal but they have to sell part of who they are to attract the world to the way of the world is fallen the way of the world is fallen the world's going somewhere are we going there and it's a healthy thing to ask the question are we showing others that because they're going to get lost if no one shows them. That's just how it is. But Jesus came to show us all. Eternity carries a weight. That's why those who were mocked on account of Jesus, they rejoiced. Because they know that eternally, this is the greatest move I can make. And hallelujah, I am different from that that is perishing. I'm going to spend just about two minutes just wrapping up with the last part of this chapter. It says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Because this is the last hour. There's a lot of people today that are like, the world's going to end very, very shortly. The world's going to end very soon. Perhaps in, when we read Matthew 24, we know that certain things have to happen. First off, it says the gospel, the kingdom, has to be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. This gospel, this truth, Everyone on earth, every tribe, tongue, and nation, he says, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations first. Then the end will come. And I know certain missionary, um, missionary groups that are actually, they've like plotted. They've been like, oh, it's the gospel. Here's God. And, and they want to actually make sure every tribe, tongue, and some of these tribal nations have it. And, it, and it's God who's going to bring it. It's no human that's going to bring the end, but it's coming. But it says here, this is the last hour. We don't know. When Hitler rose up, they probably said, that's the last hour. Medieval times, that's the last hour. It literally says, you don't know, like a thief in the night's gonna come. But what is he saying here? He's using a certain language. See, the Bible, people say, I take it all literary, liter literally, but there's certain poetic language in the Bible. Just like you and I use poetic language day to day, metaphors, similes, he's doing that here. This is the last hour. It's been the last hour for 2,000 years. He's saying it is, so the clock, is God's clock. It's not yours and our clock. It's not one hour, you know, um, a millennial, somewhere along the line, we started saying, I'll be there in a minute, that meant 20, you know? Like, yeah. you know, um, we do this all the time. It's been in, in, in an hour, meaning a, a length of time, an hour. The hour on the clock of God's history, not ours. It's the last hour. The hour of grace that is given to you through Jesus, you have a chance now to receive it. It says there's antichrists that are coming. And this will be important for next week to consider and remember that there are Gnostics there. One of the teachings of the Gnostics who have put forth these false teachings, one of the reasons John has written 
is that there were some who would claim that Jesus was not the Christ. It says, whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ is the Antichrist. Now, that happens many times today. People make Jesus out to be just another way. Jesus said, I'm the one way, truth, and life. If you mix Jesus with other, that is the sign of an Antichrist. If you wholly believe that, you're, you're speaking that, you're, that literally says. Okay? Now, the Antichrist, that he's in, whoever denies Jesus is the Christ, some believe that the Christ was God who descended on a man, merely, not God, named Jesus. At the cross, the Spirit of God left him and he was left to die on his own. But it was a man who did it, not God who died on the cross. That's a terrible, terrible heresy. It's terrible. Because if God hasn't paid the penalty for our sins, we're all done. Because no human could do that. No human could bear that weight. So they taught that the Christ left Jesus. Verse 27 says, As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 says, So Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. It says Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So God has given pastors, teachers, but he says here you don't need anyone to teach you. Amen. See, God doesn't say, that guy right over there, yeah, yeah you need him to teach you. Actually, the people that had left them, they were, they were wondering, hey, hey, they were talking about this knowledge. I need to go to them to receive this secret, hidden, esoteric knowledge. And he's saying, no, no, you have the anointing of God in you. You have God on your life. Now, God has anointed certain people for these specific positions, but it's through his spirit, through them, that God will teach you. And, and his spirit in them will build up the spirit in you. But if that person were to fall, as we see so many pastors fall, as we see people that that you really believe are godly, and then they walk away from the faith. He says that they went out from us because they were not of us. Sometimes, in the message we can have from here, sometimes you see people and you believe they're a Christian, but you don't know what someone's hope is really in. It's between them and God. And sometimes people walk a certain way, and he says, you don't need that person to teach you. You've got God inside of you. The only God. John 13, 20 says, Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. It's because they're sent by Jesus. How do you know? If you have the Spirit of God inside of you, He'll do the work for you. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for the grace of your people to uh, hear out this whole sermon, God. And I thank you for your peace that you give to us, Lord. Thank you for the love that you have for us, God. I thank you for the anointing you've put on your called ones, your chosen people, God. Father God, I'm asking that those who are in the faith would be encouraged today, God. That they would know that, that they're born again, that they're saved not by what they do, but by what you've done. And God, I ask that they would welcome your work in their life, God, and turn to you day by day, God. Father God, anyone who may have that this message that you've spoken through me, God, anyone that may have heard it that doesn't know you, Father God, I'm asking, Lord, that they would come out of the darkness into the light by approaching you, by confessing their sins, as we talked about last week, God, turning to you and receiving the forgiveness that comes from following you. I thank you that it's a glorious, glorious thing to worship you. It's not hard in the sense where it's overly burdensome. It's a joy. Father God, and I just commit everything that was said into your hands, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be here.
Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.